Being that it's six o'clock, I'm going to call this meeting of the Enfield Select Board to order, and we are going to start with approval of the minutes. We have the minutes. They are um, long, as well as our meeting. Thank you, Emily. I know they were. Well, I thought, given the complexity of yes. taking those minutes, that they were just outstanding. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Very good. Yeah, I would move that we accept them as presented. I second that. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? I just have um, yep. Lee Davis's name is spelled. Oh, where's on um, what page line? Page one line twenty. Oh, yep. It's L E I G H. Thank you, John. Are you okay with amending it? Absolutely. Okay. Can you okay so, yes, a second. Excellent. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Moving on, um, town manager's reports. I'm sorry, board reports. Good Lord. Already jumping ahead. Let's start at the beginning of the table. Uh -huh, Eric? Yeah. Uh, planning board met at uh, public hearing. Sorry, I uh, reviewed for the car and bingo hall. I don't know what they're formally calling it, but the old Sugar Valley Auto um, building that Colorants are converting to a bingo hall that was approved. Um, the one contingent was around the sewer slash septic, and some of that comes. I don't know what the. I actually haven't had a chance to follow up with you on on what that means because it's a whether <clears throat> whether or not they have to connect to the town sewer that now runs down Route Four. More than likely, I've had a little bit of discussions about that and more than likely if they want a waiver for that it's going to have to come before the select board mm -hmm. the last time the select board gave a waiver for that it, it was pretty much if it's a change of use or change of ownership mm -hmm. that they would have to connect at that time okay well in this case both of those things yeah. are there's a change of ownership and a change of use absolutely right so anyway it's not on the agenda to talk about tonight but that is something that is within our purview and it was there was a lot of discussion just around you know because of course the planning side is the site plan is the planning board but the sewer side is for is for us and making sure they got all that straightened out but um anyway it's kind of an exciting new business that they're starting in a, what seems like a really nice use for an existing facility and that was all we did thank you thank you tell us um the heritage commission has not met since our last meeting the Enfield Village Association had a visioning session on Saturday to plan for their 2024 activities, and they're making a concerted effort to recruit volunteers. Um, and we had Eva also had a newcomer picnic Sunday in Hughes Park, which was moderately attended. There was about between 10 and 15 new to town um, within the past five years to three weeks ago. Um, uh, Ed was there. Eric was there. Thank you so much for coming. I think it was a really good time. Um, and that's all I have. Our next board meeting is Tuesday. Thanks. Voting committee, nothing to report. Energy committee hasn't met since our last meeting, but there continues to be some listserv activity that I know members of the board try to answer for the best of their ability with regard to the community power service. Um, conservation met. We actually met twice. So um, first regularly scheduled meeting, which was a reschedule due to scheduling conflict, uh, was the primary meeting. Patty Freed kindly came and gave us a presentation on rain gardens and how they could help control stormwater. So thank you to Patty. It was very good. Um, I think when the YouTube posting comes up, it'd be very interesting for folks to watch and we'll be looking at doing more surrounding that in the future. Uh, there was a discussion on the budget. There was some confusion and um, so I'll cover that again in a second. Um, we met new potential member, Ed Brippy, who is on the agenda tonight uh, to, for possible membership on the Conservation Commission. So that's exciting. And there was um, some pretty lively discussion around donating conservation fund money to the Enfield Shaker Museum. Um, I called their attention to the fact that you can't do those kind of donations without noticing it. So it went on to a special meeting. Um, the special meeting 
was last Thursday. Uh, it was a very challenging meeting, and uh, there were two legal opinions, which I believe Ed has shared with you guys, uh, basically explaining that conservation fund money has to be used for conservation purposes. Uh, the folks at Enfield Shaker Museum were nice, two of them were nice enough to come. And so I think there's an understanding that they would have to have a distinct conservation purpose in order to be you know, given any, any funds. It was also, um, another discussion surrounding the budget and I think we got that nailed down so that's what I have on that I think unless anyone has questions of each other we'll move on to town manager's report all right thank you um to start off as usual the police department continues to work through looking to replace the two officers that we lost um and then other than that um as you guys may have heard norm rule our water sewer operator passed away. Um, with that, um, we are starting to look at the process of, of replacement position. Um, with Norm Rule, I would like to thank all the first responders who responded to that call. Enfield um, Ambulance was there, the fire department, police department, and the Lebanon um, ambulance responded. Um, so, a quick response and a, I don't know if I want to say good response, but we had good turnout people on scene quickly. It's just an unfortunate incident that happened. And I'd also like to thank the fire department and all the other services that um, worked to, to put together the memorial services and support the family. They did a, a really good job and the family was very appreciative. So thank you to everybody that was involved in that. Um, Public safety building Whitney Hall. Um, we continue on Whitney Hall. We continue to work on the development of a new floor, land, floor plan based around keeping an elevator shaft, elevator, mechanical room, and staircase. The new floor plan um, currently undergoing budget review process to determine cost savings. We're really close. As I told you before, and need to get out. We'll get you the, the updated plans as soon as they're. They're a little bit more nailed down. We're really close. The last meeting we were talking about moving just a couple walls and some doors. So it's it's really close to being done. Um, I'm working on the final details of the Shaker Hill granite land purchase. I'm talking with the attorney today, trying to get the final paperwork drafted up and hope to have that for just complete within the next month. Um, the public safety building's in about the same spot as Whitney Hall. We finally, with your guys' help last meeting, um, got an electrician and mechanical plumber on staff or on um, with Neely and Chase's subcontractors and they have met together and they're working right now on some budget stuff and looking at if they can massage the mechanical plumbing electrical plants to, to do a little bit more cost savings. So we're kind of in that budget phase trying to trying to make sure we're within the budget that, that we have available. Um, I would like to introduce um, the town of Enfield's new story walk. If you haven't seen it at the Shaker ball fields, the story walks a delightful, innovative way for folks of all ages to enjoy reading while being out outdoors. Um, they can walk the little circle of reading posts and read a children's book as they're exercising and spending some time outside. The idea, at least as well as I know it was first brought forward by Jane Plumley, and then with some work with Shirley and some others, it was funded by the Eastman Charitable Foundation. Um, Kevin Marker, Kate Minshaw um, kind of designed it and worked together with DPW to have it installed. So I'd like to thank everybody that was involved in that. On September 30th from 11.30 to 1.30, there's going to be a, a grand opening event at the Shaker Ball Fields. There'll be Everyone's welcome. There'll be activities at all 18 signs for the kids and there'll be refreshments. So please come out and help us celebrate the new story walk. Um, wanted, to, wanted to thank the fire department as well and just let you guys know a few of the things that have happened this month. Um, I think it was at the same time as our last meeting, but um, the Fire department did a great job helping the town and turning a project into a training opportunity. So during the July storms, we had a paddle boat that washed down the Mascoma River and got stuck. 
not only did they go get the paddle boat out of the river for us, but they turned it into a swift water training event and they did the full setup and practiced what they would do on a swift water rescue scenario. So that was a, a great use of time, great way to do training and help the town get that paddle boat out of the river. And then I'd also like to thank them. Um, and Kim Winthrow kind of put it together, but they fire department got together, went over and um, was it Joyce? Help Joyce Osgood stack some wood. She's, you know, her health isn't allowing her to do that. So they went over together and stacked wood for her for the winter. So it was a great, great support type um, project. And I'd like to thank them for going above and beyond. Um, we did get some not so great news today. Um, I don't know if you guys heard, but President Biden declared the disaster of the July for July storms. Unfortunately, this did not include Grafton County. So we've reached out. Um, Chief Holland was working on it today. We reached out to Homeland Security to see what we could do to secure some funding. There is possibilities, and they've done it before, where we're a bordering town to Sullivan County that was listed that we may be able to get a little bit of money. So we'll continue to work on that. Um, it's really based on the amount of damage in your county, not in your town. So um, with that, we didn't quite make the threshold to, to be included. Um, and then quick updates for the um, PPW. The Maple Street project is pretty much complete. They completed most of the punch list items. They're going to be doing a little bit of landscaping, but for the most part, they're, they're done with that project. Um, the EPW teamed up with regional planning and they hosted a composting workshop here this weekend. It was very well attended. They had about 20 attendees and I heard it was a, a great workshop. So that was really good. And then one update, um, a couple weeks ago, we had another well incident. It looks like prior well two was possibly hit by lightning. So that well pumps out. So that's our third well pump we're replacing this year. Um, me and me back talk to the select board about that because it's not cheap. But um, the, I guess the good thing was two of those well pumps were fairly old. One of them was old enough that the well company was pretty shocked it was still in service. I mean, we definitely got our money's worth out of it, but having three go in one year is not not a good thing. Um, but with that, you know, the other ones are back online running strong. So. Not that we like to be down a well, but if we are, we have two running right now. So good. And with that, that's my select board report. Are there any questions for the town manager? Seeing none, let's move on to the business of the evening. We have Bleacher Repair Eagle Scout Project. If you'd like to come up and sit at the table, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, good evening. My name is Emilio Maltz. Uh, I'm a Life Scout uh, from Troop 44. Um, I am here presenting um, a project idea that I have for my Eagle Scout project. And so my idea is at uh, Shaker uh, Recreational Park. Um, you know, it's used often. You know, there are a lot of sports games. You know, people come to watch it. The families love to see their family, or, um, their kids, you know, play. And so they'll use the bleachers that they have. And so we i looked at them and they're getting kind of old kind of weathered right and so i do have pictures that um in their current condition here i'll show you so you'll see that they are paint it's pretty much gone um you can see that it was uh like a forest green at one point uh that there's no more paint uh, there's chips in it, you know, pieces missing. This could easily, um, you know, cause a splinter, you know, a small little thing, but still an injury. That was still something that should be considered. Uh, and you can also see the frame, too, um, has lost most of its paint, um, mostly rust now. And so my project idea is to uh, refurbish these bleachers. Uh, so my plan is to take off the old seats, um, buy some new wood, which will be used for the seats, um, I'll paint it the same forest green that it is now, um, or once was. And what it will do is we'll clean the frame too, 
repaint the frame in the green color too, and then put the seats on, and then it should be done. Uh, you can so, like I said, there are chips missing, no more paint really. So uh, what we're planning on, so what we usually do with our Eagle Scout projects is we have members from our troop uh, help out. That's kind of a tradition in our troop. We have we all help each other out, and then once we're in this position, as I am right now, we usually ask, look to our younger scouts help, and then they're in this position, and so on. So that's usually where um, we get our helpers from. So those will be like the volunteers. If I need family members or friends, I'll look to them too. And so that's how we plan on getting it done. Uh, an estimated cost right now, it's not um, exact, but right now we're looking probably $700 to $800. Um, of course, the town is not um, required to pay this. Um, if there is money that they have for a project like this um, and they would like to offer, um, it would be accepted. But of course, the town is not required. Uh, this is my project. So uh, right now we're playing on just donations is how we're going to fund this. And uh, safety concerns um, is it's not a difficult project. Um, mainly we'll just be using like wrenches or ratchets to take off the seats. Um, we'll probably use like a, a sander or something to clean the frame, which um, according to our scouting guidelines, safety guidelines, um, the younger scouts cannot use this. But as an older scout, I am permitted to use this so that I will probably be the one doing it. Or um, if needed, we'll have an adult like our scout master. Um, do this for us. And I think that's all. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, something that I haven't covered that let's know more about. Yeah, so typically we just offer the board a chance to ask a few questions or make a few comments. So I'll start at the end of the table if anybody has it. Uh, would you do the work on site or would you have to remove the bleachers? So um, taking it off, of course, and then putting it back on um, is really probably the only on site we would need. And of course, to clean the frame. We would probably take the new boards and find a spot, most likely at my house, um, and to repaint, to paint them, because we'll leave them in the garage, you know, uh, to dry. And so, you know, the, there's rain or something. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep them in good condition. And then we'll bring them, those new seats, to uh, the bleachers and we'll put them on. So most of the work will be done on site, but that's just taking it off, taking it, uh, putting it on. I guess finally, that would be standing metal. In an open space where there might be people park or something, we've got to think about that. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll have like um, some caution tape, probably. We'll put some stakes and wrap caution tape just so people know. Yeah, we might want to coordinate as well with down to, yeah, you know, yeah, we could connect to recreation to yeah. see when the fields are scheduled. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, um, you don't want to show up on Saturday morning and start, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'd be inconvenient. Yeah. Yes, well, it, that would be, you know. And I rated safety as we go. It's very possible to do it there. Yes. But it takes a little scheduling. Yeah. Alice, do you have anything? Um, yeah. Do you, are you thinking about a time frame, like when you might like to start and when you'd like to be completed by? So, of course, hoping to start as soon as possible. Um, so, of course, we need approval from a select board. And then I would have to send my proposal off to um, our council, Daniel Webster Council, for their approval. Um, Right now, we're let's see, we're mid September, so hopefully by early to mid October. And I don't expect it to take too long, of course, you know, considering when maybe there's games or something. Um, but it could be done in like just two days straight. Um, I wouldn't, it's not what I'm planning on because I would like to give the board some time to dry and we'll need some more time to, you know, clean the frame. So probably two weeks, just the weekend. Uh, maybe three weeks. So I'm planning on having it done by uh, November, before November, before we have to start worrying about, um, you know, the winter. Do you have anything? No, sounds like a great idea. I think it's a swell idea. Um, I heard you mention safety. I hope yeah. you're going to have whoever does the metal framing, standing yeah. and scraping with masks. Gonna, yes, they'll have masks, they'll have goggles and gloves when they do it. Great. Yes. And oh, uh, also, when we do that, we are planning on putting a tarp down to catch any of um, the rust that will fall off. And then we I think pick up the tarp. Great. We don't know how old the paint is. Terrific. Um, where can someone send a donation? Um, I'm not. 
have not thought, thought that far ahead, um, would have a check probably made out. Um, well, unless the town. You can coordinate with the town. Yeah. We'll take donations to help get it to the right Yeah. So. My question is actually for Ed. Do we have any, has that been a project line item in recreation at all, or were there any funds already set aside for this repair? It wasn't this year, but we were looking at budgeting for next year. So we, we will look at this year's recreation budget. We'll collect donations and, and see what happens. I think it looks like a great project. Um, if there's no other questions from the board, I would entertain a motion to approve this project as presented. I so move. Wait a second. Second. Yeah. Okay. Final call on questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? It passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Okay. We look forward to seeing it. And if you can fit us in when you're finished, we'd love to hear about your Yeah, final. I will keep you updated on progress. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay. I, I don't see Wendy on the front of him. Online. So I think we'll skip over the county update for now um, and go on to short term rental discussion. OK, um, we had a lot of feedback, which is obviously um, resulted in some long minutes. We've gotten some feedback. I think everyone's gotten a bunch electronically. And so I want to start just by going around the table with some some basic thoughts. Uh, Eric. Um, so I guess uh, how detailed do you want us to be? I actually, uh, this morning. If you, are you ready to rewrite it? Because we'll move well, I, <laughs> I sent an edited draft this morning okay. that I had been through a couple of times. Um, but let me try to hit the High points more first. discussive points. Um, uh, one thing that I, you know, we heard a lot was around trying to distinguish between um, sort of homeowners that are renting it short term, you know, for a very few number of nights versus long. So I uh, edited one just saying something along the lines of, you know, short term rental rented for 14 nights or fewer per calendar year and is the owner's primary residence would not need a permit or inspection, but all the other um, requirements of the ordinance would apply and remain in effect. I Meaning they'd still have to post everything, but they wouldn't necessarily have to verify everything with an inspection as, as a, starting point for that. Um, I, I wrote in a sort of a maximum term for going between inspections, um, sort of open-ended at this point. But if you're going to have an inspection process, you don't necessarily have to inspect every year, to my mind. Um, but you probably don't want to wait 20 years between mm -hmm. inspections. Um, I deleted the uh, reference to campers, trailers, tents, that kind of stuff. The uh, the occupancy limits set the number of people who would be spending the night. And if you know a family wanted to have their kids sleep in a tent and it was appropriate for the property, I don't see any reason to mm -hmm. you know, prevent that from happening. Um, Um, sort of a small thing, but I just wrote in a start date for when people can submit applications. And I wrote November 15th of the prior year, mostly just to create a cycle, try to create a cycle for how it works. Um, and then some editing just around things where like the max, maximum number of occupants. <clears throat> At one point we define it, then at another point um, the draft says it can be requested. There's no real need to request something that's clearly defined. Mm -hmm. um, so just edits like that. Uh, and then at the bottom, just a few definitions we need to come up with. Uh, you know, we say first offense, second offense, um, but it doesn't clearly define that. And to my mind, each night would qualify as a quote offense, you know, one night or not, you know, for a rental necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, that's a clear way to do it. And then also somewhere, and as soon as I scroll through, there's a mention of daytime guests with uh, day guest occupancy, which is not defined 
<laughs> and if we're going to distinguish between overnight occupancy and day occupancy, we need to be clear on what that is, both in terms of well, so like if, if somebody were to leave at four in the morning, were they a day guest or an overnight guest? Um, so just another another piece of the, the puzzle to be equipped. Um, so those I think, other than small, yeah, it's a link to set the big points that I'm three. Alice. Um, I had more like general uh, feedback. I just wanted to go to one of your points about um, the occupancy and then it was like a pup it can be requested. I thought that was like I thought the intent of that was it can be contested if you think that you should have more people than are on the back part. That may have been the intent. I think that we should be, my view is we should be consistent with everybody. And if um, the reason for doing it is safety and then the septic slash sewer capability, the number of bedrooms on the tax card yeah. would be a consistent way to apply to everybody. And if somebody has more bedrooms, then they should be. I should, may have clarified like, that. Do we want yeah. it to be contestable or not? I think what I wrote in there and the one I gave you this in the packet has mm -hmm. been updated. The red line didn't come through because they got PDF. But um, <laughs> um, I'd have to find that bar, but it was it was really trying to define that if you have a septic system that was approved by DES, you could request more than what the tax card said, but you had to prove that you had a septic system rated for that. That was kind of what I understood. Mm -hmm. So it maybe needed to be defined a little better, and I think I did it. I just need to find that section. So if not, we can work on that. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of the thought behind it is we would go by the stated number of bedrooms and that. And if you thought you should have more, you're going to have to prove that you have a rated system that could handle it. Well, they'd have to prove they have more bedrooms. I guess we have what? Yeah. Which. What are you, do we want to get into? Bedrooms or beds, like you can have like phone calls? Well, no, because we defined it as. Well, it'd have to be space. I mean, it really right. comes down to the septic system is why mm -hmm. we've defined it that way, but it would have to be safe as well. I mean, there's fire safety criteria. Right. I think it'd be easily defined mm -hmm. the way we could do it and we could administer that mm -hmm. consistently. But mm -hmm. is there a clear process for people who are on the sewer? Because obviously they don't have a capacity issue uh, with septic. Well, they do just in the fact that they you pay for capacity. So we got, we can look into that yeah. a little bit more, but you know you yeah. haven't paid development fees in the past, right. but it's based on the amount of bedrooms you have in your house. Right. So. right. But if we're going to a situation where somebody could have something be a bedroom that's not a bedroom they won't have necessarily gone through all of that mm -hmm. which this just gets you get a lot of these complicated corner cases when you go beyond just using the number of bedrooms mm -hmm. a lot of people have a room that might get used for like an overnight stay that isn't necessarily a bedroom right right Right. It's pretty common. Yeah, no, it is. But but a lot of these, like the development fees and stuff, are based on the number of bedrooms you have. Yeah. So you're creating a real incentive for somebody to say, "Oh, I have a two-bedroom house, have several of those other rooms to be hooked up to sewer, and then all those rooms are perfectly safe, perfectly, you know, no issues at all with people staying in them, mm -hmm. and expand the capacity, and then move that development cost onto the other users in town." Okay. And also, it's a little unfair to the people who are on septic if I just want something that balances both of those cases. I was gonna say, when they're on the sewer, they could, I mean, they could create that other bedroom and make right. it sufficient, but they'd have to pay the development fee right. to get that added to the tax card. To, so there's yeah. still a process to do. So still going by the tax card. Right. At that point, you're you still be there. there. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think the tax card is the. To me, the tax part is sort of the fair, equitable way to treat every homeowner in town. Mm -hmm. Because there are ways, if somebody has also expanded their septic and has it, why isn't, and you know, they want to use it as a bedroom, why isn't it defined as a bedroom? Mm -hmm. I sort of feel like they're the same case. Okay. 
think so. Alice? Um, and then I had a, um, a question. So there's an affidavit that needs to be signed attesting that this list of things are in safety issues are taken care of. But then there's also an inspection that's required for each property before it gets issued this registration. Is that correct? B or I think it might be written that way. Or yeah. B. So you have to be inspected and sign the affidavit. Well, I think that so my interpretation was that that fit because you're not going to get inspected every single year. Right. But you have to, as part of your application each year, part of the new permit. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. permit. You know, say this is all still in place. And it's really, I mean, it's to a large extent a formality to mm -hmm. sign that document as part of your application. I mean, I don't think that's the barrier. Maybe I'm misinterpreting. No, it just, it just yeah. seemed kind of like you either got inspected or you signed an affidavit. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. No. Seems redundant to me. Um, then, do we require any inspections like these for long term rentals? Or is this only for short term rentals? This is, this would only be for. And there's nothing in the town like this that applies for long. I don't think we have anything in place. Um, some towns have them for multifamily mm -hmm. properties, mm -hmm. but usually single family residences and duplexes, even on long terms, are not. But if you're making a modification to your home or property such that you add, you you are supposed to be getting permits. Yeah, you will. So get permits, right? <laughs> I will say there is a process. It was right. isn't called out, but you know, whenever you add something, I mean, like you add another kitchen or another bathroom, you as much sure. as not everybody realizes that. Sure. In in general, um, I think you know permits are needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just I'm reading it mm -hmm. with the lens of things that I heard from people. Yeah. and one of the things I heard was like, why are short term rentals held to this when long term rentals aren't? And so I just wanted to be transparent that I'm noticing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought the affidavit and the inspection was redundant and not clear that it will be reinspected on a most needed basis, but no less than once every five years. I thought that was a little vague. Um, and then on the last page, H7, Notification that short-term rental occupants and guests are required to make the dwelling unit available for inspection by the enforcement officer upon request. Um, I think that some people may have had strong feelings about like an announcement. Well, I edited that. Well, did I edit? Maybe I didn't. I was looking at that, but. Think about it. Trying to word it in a way <laughs> the enforcement officer would make a request. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I noticed I I really um was a fan of the piece that said that the PPOC has to be within 30 minutes, but I think you changed it to 60. I, was wondering I did. There was a lot of concern at the meeting that, you know, if someone had somebody in Norwich, they may not make it here in 30 minutes. And like, so how, like, but for the intent of it, how did 30 minutes change it? I guess I don't understand. I think it's more for someone to be able to respond and deal with an issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how long is our people going to remain on scene if they need to or. Mm -hmm. They may not need to, and I don't know. I just started thinking if we look at like an hour radius, mm -hmm. that encompasses, you know, down towards Claremont, up a little ways, gives you maybe over even to Concord, but someone could get here in a reasonable amount of time where 30 minutes may have been really restricting that circle a little bit. The distance across the Mascoma district, just as a reference, if you go point to point, is an hour in many cases, um, which is, sounds crazy, but within one school district, you can drive an hour to get somewhere. So um, I don't think an hour is terrible. And I think as long the the point is that it's a time limit. Um, yeah, and it's just really someone that's close enough that can deal with an issue if it arises. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really what we're looking for. It's, um, I don't know if anybody's really going to be 
setting a stopwatch and going, you were an hour and two yeah. minutes. It was, yeah. <laughs> I think, well, as far as the intent, I did like 30, but I'm also happy to be in the minority. Like, I'm not going to belabor that. Um, and then another, I feel like kind of underscoring the need for this ordinance. I feel like some wind was taken out of the sails when people thought that it was duplicating ordinances that were already in place. So I was kind of rereading it with that lens. And I was thinking, like, I don't know if a burn permit like you have to have a burn permit to burn so I don't know if we need to specify that um the trash ordinances are already out there um just kind of thinking of things where we could say actually this is a standalone ordinance that is very much needed it's not duplicating other efforts that the town is making um so those are my thoughts thank you John but just in, in, with reference to the burn permit for example People uh, short term uh, rental basis may not even be aware that that there is such a need unless we post it somehow. But I think having it part of this document makes absolute sense. Um, the, the one piece that, that I thought there was pretty good consensus on was that the fines that we have in print last version I saw were insufficient. Given what can be made, they're sort of the cost of doing business. Yeah, I did raise them yeah. in this. So oh, you did, question, okay. But I need to do a little bit of research of what we what we can and can't mm -hmm. do. Tell you the truth, I just added a zero to the end of each of those, so from a hundred bucks to a thousand dollars. Oh, <laughs> maybe some compromise. <laughs> but no, I'll research that a little bit. Yeah. But, Again, it needs to look at that, and there is multiple steps with the first one being a warning. We don't, I mean, uh, the, the effort behind yeah. this is for compliance, not. Right. And I, I think first step being a warning is absolutely appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, John? Nope. I see. I still have uh, an issue with finding the empirical evidence of the scope or the need of this issue. I would like to find out how many residents are using their home for short-term rentals with a differentiation between identifying those residences that are not occupied by the homeowner, those residences that do short-term rentals for a limited period of time, such as 10 days per year, 20 days per year, 30 days per year, et cetera, and homes that are known by others or self-identify as short-term residences should receive a letter inquiring the nature of their use that might be affected by the adoption of this ordinance and that along with other information should be used to help quantify the scope of this issue homes that are lakefront property can be asked about the condition and age of their septic systems and the number of people typically staying can be asked as well for residences that are willing to reply to such a questionnaire this type of information will be gathered and used to identify the issue and necessarily create the ordinance specifically shaped to the nature of the scope of the issue for those residences that are not willing to reply to a questionnaire i'm sure they'll be identified by others and the nature of their business will become known i would like to make a motion to table this from further discussion until we have the empirical evidence of the scope of this issue i have a motion before you is there a second once twice seeing no second motion fails do you have other items you'd like to add? No. Okay. I, I do have one okay. question. Just, do you have a suggestion on how we would gather adequate data? Yes, as I said, uh, I would like a letter to be sent out to those residences, particularly the ones around the lake, and to other residences that we know to have short-term rentals. Um, and those short-term rentals can be identified either by themselves or by others. Uh, but a questionnaire should be sent out with some very basic information. How much do you rent it out? And if you are a lakefront property, what is the condition of your septic system? And how many people do you average staying there at a period in time? So how do you identify who to send that letter to? Because I start with everyone who lives around lakefront property on all the lakes in this town. And then there are other properties that I heard repeated through our discussion 
from many people who said that they have two or three residences on their street adjacent to those streets that are to the lake. This isn't a lakefront ordinance, though. This is a no. town-wide ordinance. I understand. And so it's, how do you identify it? I, I guess I'm I don't... trying to gather, Nate, uh, the scope of the issue. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, but, and gathering data is always a good idea. I think there's two things. Well, I don't think, I don't think you've identified a way to add it. To, so if three people reply, is that adequate? I don't think there's, I don't think there's any clear way to gather the data we need. And if you're going to gather the information from the people who are, well, one, probably we, we heard a lot. We gathered a lot of information already. Mm -hmm. But you also have to go to the other side and go to all of the people in town who are next to a short-term rental and all the people in town who are trying to find a you know, long-term rental. And there's no real limit to the data collection. We and gathered the, some anecdotal information. Correct. I don't believe that that's adequate to write an ordinance. I guess what I'm saying is, I don't think there's a way to get anything other than anecdotal information. And it's our job to respond to issues that are brought before us by the townspeople. And this is one of those. I don't think we have enough information to write a very specific ordinance about it. I think the ordinance as drafted is overly complicated. It should start as a simpler ordinance on which we can build in the future. But I believe we could gather enough information if we send questionnaires out to people who particularly live around the lakefront properties. Um, okay, so I guess I'll just I'll jump off of a springboard off of that. Uh, it's really hard when you write an ordinance, any kind of ordinance in a town, right? So we have a fireworks ordinance that was purely anecdotal. Um, it turned into people demanding data. And I think one of the things that happens when people don't want something done is they instantly demand data. So it's another also barrier to stop people. So I want to be cognizant of the fact that people came to us with real stories and real feelings, and they didn't all call the police because they're not all bad neighbors. And that doesn't mean you're a bad neighbor if you call the police, but not everything in life um, takes an official report, right? So I believe those people, and I think we represent both the people who make the reports and the collectible data and the people who are more anecdotal. Uh, so I want to balance that out. I am just going to go down my quick list of things that I saw that I had questions on or I wasn't quite sure how to word. Uh, so I want to see the occupancy be a function of the septic and bedrooms. I like the tax card idea. Uh, I just don't know how to word it. And I've really been, I'm very focused on be it septic or sewer. I don't want to see these basement, no window, eight bad bunk rooms because I've stayed in places that are questionable. I've seen a lot of really nice ones that are very safe too. So I think that's really, really important. The life safety piece is the biggest component of this for me. I see the short term rental ordinance as a way to also be welcoming and say to our people who joint come into our town, you know, you want them to be at a place that's nice and you want them to enjoy it and you want them to get along with the neighbors because sometimes somebody comes and visits and they say to you, wow, this is a pretty awesome place and they want to live here with us. And and I think that's pretty great. I like it here, um, went away and came back for a reason. So I don't want to see it only as a deterrent. I want to see it as a tool that enables people to make good decisions. Um, and to that effect, I think in some of, I heard a lot of the feedback on, well, this covers another ordinance. We might be able to simplify by referring to the other ordinance and making sure they're called out. So burn permit, right? Like we know we need a burn permit, but, and we know we need to do fireworks on a certain day. I can tell you from experience with lots of friends who rent in other places, they're like, yeah, you can just shoot off fireworks. I'm like, there's no fire anything right now, my friends. Like you'll burn down the whole neighborhood. So I think just some of those little pieces that seem like handholding are good to just have posted, be it, you know, where you can park, mm -hmm. what the trash ordinance is. And it's also a good call out for us um, we do have a solid waste ordinance. It's We have some work to do on ordinances, so we need to probably update that. Uh, the noise ordinance is like a hawkers and peddlers, like little monkey does the noise thing ordinance. It's like, if you read it, it says not very modern. So we probably need to look at a modern, no, for real though, it's like, if we could find the original, it would be probably in cool print with a soapbox. Um, electioneering. It's electioneering ordinance, right? It's from like when people used to come to town and be like, well, um, 
So I think there are some opportunities to work on other ordinances where we make sure we're to reference the ordinance so that say the noise ordinance got changed, we wouldn't have to be like, where else mm -hmm. do we have to go change this? Like to get the tie in, right? Mm -hmm. Like reference it. Um, and maybe to that end, we have like an appendix that's the item that gets posted. So it could be something that could be updated administratively. Like here's what you're going to post and it has the the so that you don't have to come to the select board for the posting with information items. Um, I actually thought of doing that as the permit. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Here it is and we can fill in the amount of occupants and the parking and those things. And yeah. Here's your permit. Um, and so the, the trash can thing, um, I know trash is like big feelings around here. I have big feelings about my trash can, um, I, namely that I hate both of them uh, because they're huge and I can't drag them into the spot in my original can. That being said, they work great and it doesn't hurt anyone's back. So I think we're going to have a hard time making people hide their trash cans if they aren't doing so already. And since we don't make anybody else in town hide their trash can. Um, <laughs> There's actually one exception. We do make commercial properties screening their trash cans. But we're supposed to all be taking our no, trash cans. No, no, no yeah. I suppose there, there's, yeah. there's an exception where when commercial activity is happening, we do make commercial yeah. properties screen their, their. So yeah. I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah, there's, no, there's, I just, that would I kind of like, I would love to not see yeah. an entire yeah. lane of trash cans driving through town. I think most of us don't love seeing them. Uh, I just don't know how practical that piece is. I did edit the part that said you can't keep it outside. Yeah. That lady made a good point there everybody else yeah. does i mean i have to because my indoor spot was for 55 gallon thing and it doesn't fit there anymore if someone told me i could put it in the barn i thought maybe my pig should not have my trash can <laughs> so um getting back to it uh the campers and the tents that one like my gut reaction was it would be easy to delete it my flip side is we make a campground get a permit so at what point can you stack, right? So we frequently see driving along, like somebody has a camp out at their own house. They can do that um, where you have a bunch of, maybe I let my kids go camping in the field. So I don't know on that one how to make that one fair. Um, I guess my thought would be it goes back to the septic and the occupancy. Yeah, exactly. And so if you can make the septic and the occupancy piece work with your camp trailer, because some people have a seasonal like hookup or like in-laws or something. If you've done that work already, I'm fine with it. I just don't know how to say it in a way that is ordinance language. I'm tossing that out there. Um, I edited that in your packet. Yep. On 4C on page two. 4C. Mm -hmm. And all I did was added the unless the property is property yeah. license as a camping facility. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, that's where I struggle, right? Because, like, okay, it is fun to, like, plus, I mean, I'm an adult. I just fun to throw the kids outside in the tent. Yeah. <laughs> this is me, the parent, who's like, please go outside and do your screaming out there. So I didn't, I just wanted to toss that out. I don't know what the solution is. It's just one well, of those. That may be one of those areas that we, like Eric said, maybe we take that out and see if it mm -hmm. becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know other places have had issues with that, but mm -hmm. people show up and there's four or five tents on mm -hmm. the lawn. And we, as far as I know, we have not really had that issue. It was mm -hmm. just an issue when we were doing research that other places have dealt yeah. with. And I guess for me, if we're simplifying, that's one I might try cutting out in the first instance. Um, I also think if the concern is noise, then refining the noise ordinance would be the way to go, right? Like if you're going to hoot and holler and get snammered, um, you're probably the tense the least of our worries. So, um, and then I had a few comments made to me by people about not wanting people in to inspect. Mm -hmm. Not wanting what? People to come in their home to inspect. Mm -hmm. And while I certainly understand that, uh, I think if you're going to be inviting people in and you have, you know, you have a burden of keeping them safe, I think it's okay for the time to come in and inspect. Um, I would say, so they're signing an affidavit swearing to it and you have the inspection. To me, that's your first tie in. After that, you're signing the affidavit, in my opinion, to say that you've continued to propagate conditions that meet all of these. Um, if we find you to be in violation, you're also 
you know, you've sworn a false affidavit. So I think there are consequences. Um, I don't know if we need to, or if you just get in a, whatever the offense is and you get your fine. Um, I would say in terms of surveying people to see who, I, so different towns have different ways of doing, we have Norm who does, and his team who do our um, evaluations, right? Assessments. assessments that's it, sorry, assessments. And, um, but there are towns like Canaan that have like a little card they sent out and they ask you about things like who lives here. And to be quite honest, my sister got one. She sends it to me and she's like, we bought this abandoned property from the town of Canaan. And basically it's filled with raccoons. And I was like, I would write that raccoons live there. <laughs> so I, but you don't, there's no obligation to return it. Um, I'm also the person, if I get stopped like by border patrol in the middle of New Hampshire and I'm happily driving, I'm like, why do you need to see me? And that's my personal opinion. But I think a lot of New Hampshire rights are going to be like, nope, this is none of your business. It's my house and you leave me alone. Mm -hmm. um, because this is the whole good fences make good neighbors New Englanders thing, right? A lot of us mind our own business. So I don't think you're going to get responses. Uh, I think you're going to get either reports of violations and we're going to find out after the fact. And I feel like we can look um, cyclically on... Verbo, Home Away, and Airbnb, and a few of the others, and we'll be able to see easily who may or may not have. Uh, and then we're going to have to trust people to be honest and and go into it with the idea that we're helping our neighbors, not trying to harm them or take away their income. Because I think it is, I really did hear the people who use some of this for their taxes. I think it's a fabulous way to bring in some small, even like small portion of investment. I think they do go to our restaurants and businesses. So I just want to make sure it's not, people think of ordinances being punitive, but I also see this as a teaching opportunity. That's, mm -hmm. So that's me. Mm -hmm. um does i don't know what you guys want to do tonight if you want to do some revisions mm -hmm. but i have one more comment about the enforcement piece that mm -hmm. is reading just like anything whatever mm -hmm. google university <laughs> so now i'm an expert yeah but <laughs> but one of like one of the enforceable pieces is that you you i don't know who contacts airbnb verbo booking.com and Short-term rentals in the town of Enfield cannot list with them unless they have a registration number that gets posted with their rental. Um, so I don't, I don't know. That's just I thought that that was part of the enforcement piece. They will help. Will they? Did you ask the question? Will they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. My understanding is that if the town or whoever reaches out to them and says, we have a registration system. And uh, oh. I can send you the article. Google University for the win. I don't know that I'm right. Well, I no, but it's it. an interesting, <laughs> because a, a lot of corporations won't. No, it can't hurt. Um, so I don't, next steps, is this, enough feedback to do another draft or I yeah we can do another draft and I can get it sent out red lined okay. and, and I'll highlight the ones that I did make from the last time mm -hmm. so they're more readily easily found yeah. um before we move on to since we have some public here I want to get comments from the public on the short-term rental ordinance if there are any but Dan? just just one you need to use the sewer the septic and not the number of beds, mm -hmm. bedrooms, because if I've got a pull out couch, mm -hmm. I'm going to put that as a part of my occupancy, but it's not a bedroom. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where you're going to see, mm -hmm. you know, it's like my house is two bedroom, but my septic is for five. Because mm -hmm. when I had to put in, put it in, because I figured down the road someday somebody might want to put an ADU. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, but that's why I think the occupancy number is, is the big number that goes with the septic and not the bedroom number. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, Shirley. Um, I had just a couple comments and listening. We rent a cottage next door to us. And uh, over the years, uh, these, one of the big things I think is it's hard when these places don't have anyone close by for oversight. Because, like, I mean, we're next door and we know what's happening. And uh, we did have 
one family and they still come that has a lot of family visit during the time they're there. And uh, we saw, you know, when they had someone visit, they put up tents. And so we immediately said to this group, and they have done it for many years, that you need to have a porta potty there. But someone that was not watching what was going on wouldn't realize that. But they bring up, they have a porta potty brought in a couple days before they arrive every summer. And they've been coming since the early 2000s. But they, <laughs> and then that takes care of the problem of the septic tank. Mm -hmm. But, and another thing that happens at our cottage too on inspections is that there's generally inspected by the uh, insurance agent every year. And they go through for safety things with, uh, you know, fireplace and, uh, and uh, smoke detectors and all kinds of things like that to make sure you have everything you need there. So that uh, really would cut down on what they had to do to inspect the place. But in uh, another thing, like uh, it just brought up was, uh, ours is a one bedroom, but there are, in the kitchen is actually a pull out cut and in the, in the living area also. So we say, you know, four to six people. And if there's more than that, they get a porta potty. But at all places, there isn't it. someone at these Airbnbs that are being rented, you know, somewhere else off site and no one's there to see what's going on. There's nothing, no one to regulate that kind of stuff. And that's where the problem is. Helpful. Anybody else who's present? Okay. We have Dave Ofe online. You can unmute. There we go. Sorry, um, I, I I agree with the comments so far that uh, um, the the septic is your key limiting factor here, and that's where um, you would certify um, occupancy based on on uh, the adequacy of the uh, of the septic system for the given number of uh, uh, occupants. Um, I think Shirley's point that uh, if there's more than that uh, and there's room on the property, um, a porta potty. Uh, can be a uh, uh, not something that would probably be um, uh, approved of by by most neighbors, but uh, um, it uh, uh, might uh, allow uh, some leeway on that. Thanks. Yeah. Is there any further discussion on this topic before we move on? I'm going to come back with another revision. Okay. Seeing none, I'd like to move on to MYSL discussion. So MYSL is Mascoma Youth Sports League. Who's seeing the platform? I will take this one. We do have Jamie's here to, to help speak on behalf of MYSL. But um, as I've stated in previous meetings over the past year that I've been I've been working with MYSL to look at the possibility of the town um, Kevin or the recreation director overseeing and administering these sports. Um, we've been doing some work together and talking about this for a little bit. I've ran some numbers, which I've added in your packet there. Um, we through through work with MISL and with Kevin, we we think this would take approximately 10 hours a week on average throughout the year. Obviously, some weeks would be more, some weeks would be less, but um, using those numbers and our personnel costs, including benefits and other, well, health benefits and other benefits, um, we broke down a cost and using those 10 hours per week, we think the total cost would be uh, about $22,931. Um, if we take out the average sports attendance and fees, it leaves us a cost of about $18,000, and I broke that down, as you see in the bottom of the chart, by participation per town um, with a cost breakdown. Um, I wanted to present this to the select board. If the select board's okay with us moving in this direction, I think it'd be good for youth sports overall. 
in the Mastoma Valley, if we were able to to manage and administer this, we would be asking those towns to to supply some funds to do that. If they were not able to, um, talking with MYSL, we would add a non-resident fee to those towns that did not do that. It may not make up the whole thing if the, some of the other towns don't do that, but I personally, I think it's good for Enfield to have a fairly robust youth sports league. I think it's good for people to, to move here, to live here, to have a a good youth sports league. And if you look at this, we make up 50% of the participation anyway. Um, and then this is including some other ideas that we possibly have for some some revenue generation through this. So overall, I think it's a, a good idea for us to move forward with the administration of this. We've had, you know, with the ebbs and flows of volunteers on the MYSL board, you know, causes some some issues just with um, consistency and and things moving forward. I think for the most part they do a really good job, but it's it's getting harder and harder to find volunteers that are willing to to put in that that level of effort. And mm -hmm. I can let Jamie speak to that a little bit more because he's been holding a lot of this on his shoulders for the past couple of years. So. Jamie, why don't you come up and sit with us? Come on down. I do avoid this. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I don't know. I know Eric. I don't know I'm you. I'm Alice. 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 John. Yeah. Tracy. Tracy and I know. Hey. So I'm I'm a lifelong resident of Enfield. Grew up here. Um, I have a nine-year-old. Um, um, but I wasn't involved with youth sports for a number of years. Um, so this is new to me. The only reason I got involved was because my son wanted to play sports. And... Um, the former rec director or whatever it was, coordinator, took another job and there was this hole. And a bunch of people volunteered to be involved and that slowly dwindled. And there's a few of us and like Ed said, we can't get volunteers. Um, so it puts a lot of pressure on the people who do do it. Um, right now, it's been a little difficult dealing with soccer season start and starting and and that usually happens in the beginning of the sport. So um, from our perspective and the con consistency of things, so someone doesn't have to start from scratch, because my prediction is because we don't get volunteers there in a couple of years from now, as I get out and a couple of other people get out, it's just going to be left and yeah. someone's going to have to come in and pick it up. Um, so that's that's our prime reason why we want the town to take it over. No, and I don't want to speak for her, but talking to Jamie and Elise about this, it's, you know, you go to your job all day, you come home, and she was spending hours a night trying to do finances and work on those types of things and scheduling and all the different things you do. And, you know, I think it makes a little bit more sense having someone like Kevin, who it's their full-time job to come in, do all this, make it happen. You know, they have the connections with the different parks and recs and, you know, the time to call during business hours mm -hmm. to make those mm -hmm. things happen. I just, I think you'll have a little bit more consistency there and uh, hopefully a well-run program. And um, one of the things that I did put in your packet and I've talked to Jamie and the board was I do, I would like to keep MYSL and the board together to play more of that booster parent type role mm -hmm. to you know continue to raise money where they can mm -hmm. to try to get parents involved but to spend a little bit more time on the kids mm -hmm. trying to host parties and do things to make youth sports you know a productive fun outing mm -hmm. i think uh as somebody who grew up at youth sports in my basement literally across from the elementary school um, I had a mom who had four kids and was a teacher, so she could not work at first because who can pay for four kids to go to daycare, right? She poured her heart and soul into it, and as kids, we volunteered too, and while that's a great and noble idea, most households have two working parents now, and I know for a fact the other day a parent walked up to me on the field, and I was like, why me, um, and couldn't figure out where she was supposed to be, and then I texted poor Jamie, <laughs> right? And so that kind of piece is where you have somebody to, like, 
when it's a volunteer, it's very, very hard because you're trying to channel everything through somebody who has another life, has another job and has a family. Uh, I think just doing the coordination component would be a big deal and having them as a, a fundraising vehicle, because I do think that community aspect is important, um, be it getting sponsors or like you, you said, parties. Uh, I think also getting coaches, there's a little bit of peer pressure that goes into getting coaches, right? I'm not trying to be being, but a lot of people are like, oh, I can't coach. It's kind of like, oh, I can't be on a committee. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, guess what? We all started not knowing what we're doing. We either figure it out or we lump it. Um, so I, I like the idea of that two part where they don't just go away. And I think it's a really important component. Uh, I also really support charging a non-resident fee if the other towns don't want to chip in. Mm -hmm. I know there's going to be some hard feelings about that, uh, but you know, it's part of life. If we want to keep the fee sound for the kids, then having the towns chip in a small amount, and it is small, proportionately, is not terrible. Uh, and certainly if they wanted to jump in and do some fundraising, they could join MYSL and probably eliminate a lot. So, uh, Eric, I should have let you go first. You don't always have to go to me first. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I just go around, it's easier. No, um, no, I think it's it's a good idea. The consistency of having a staff person to support all of the background activities will also free up. I mean, I've watched it sort of ebb and flow in like mm -hmm. the last four years since Jamie took over. It's really been every year has been a better year than the prior year. Um, and as somebody who probably caused some of his gray hair as a coach. <laughs> no, you were great. <laughs> you know, I, no, I think having a having some staff support and having it be a town thing will provide a nice a nice way to sort of keep the level and it'll, it'll free up volunteers to do the things they want to do, mm -hmm. which will also bring in more, it'll make volunteering easier. Mm -hmm. I'll put it that way. Yep. Alice, any thoughts? Um, I'm like totally in support of this. I don't have children, but I grew up with soccer, like elementary school, high school, and on to college. And I just can't imagine what my life would have been like without it. But thinking back, I had no idea what all was going on that I knew nothing about. And There's a lot of stuff like, that goes on. Think, like, this does not sound like something that a working parent could do in their spare time. Oh, but they do. do. Or I know, and it's it's, it doesn't it. sound possible. It's not in the spare time. Yeah. It's, it's at work, multiple yeah. emails. Yeah. And yeah. real time things that even today. Yeah, so, so I, I uh, totally agree. I My only concern, I don't really know this much about it, but I don't know if any of these um, fees would like preclude any of these kids from being involved in these other towns would be my only concern. I know that the fees are so nominal, but they're also nominal to me. And so that's just my perspective. So I would just be worried, like just watch and make sure that there's like no one coming from that town anymore. Maybe that would be a concern that we're being like exclusive or something. But we can work with that. However, we are expecting our taxpayers to support this. And if other towns are not willing to support it, that could be a problem. It is a problem. So that that could kill that program, I think. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we have those fees in place. Yeah. Tracy? Um, well, I'm completely and enthusiastically in favor of supporting youth sports. I have to consider the impact on the town's capability to manage and administer to the differing financial and support philosophies of our adjacent towns. I also have to look out for the infield taxpayer and the potential growth and expenses needed to take on a multi-town program that has no municipal support, but for our own. If the current program is to be sustained for Enfield resident children, and it should, it needs to be limited for a period of time to the town of Enfield, run and named as a program of the Enfield Rec Department. If other towns want to participate as out-of-town participants, either they or their town need to pay the proper cost that covers their use. We should note that the figures we received say that 50% of the children are from our town and 50% are from out-of-town, but only two of the current MYSL board members live in Enfield. No program can exist with too many overseers, so I'm not in favor of necessarily keeping the MYSL as an overseer board. That should be our rec board. The Enfield Rec Department, which is under the auspices of the Enfield Governance and Budgeting, would be receiving counsel from the Enfield Rec Board, which should function as other Enfield advisory boards do, 
and can assist to find the coaches and the volunteers to support this program. Without community support, as shown by the need for this discussion, youth sports can't exist. I just would like to comment that MYSL would not be existing as an oversight board. Mm -hmm. It would be an auxiliary mm -hmm. unit to help support youth sports. So somewhat like the Royals Athletic Boosters support the school and provide I'll, I'll call it extras yeah, without. I would think something like that. Something I mean, like that hasn't right. been determined. I just mm -hmm. want to make one correction. There are four mm -hmm. board members from Enfield. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you said only two. Yeah. When I checked the names of the board members yeah. against the Enfield resident mm -hmm. list, I only came up with two. Yeah. I'm sorry. Or myself, I can list them no, myself, um, Elise Payson, Andy Bernier, and Callie Grant. <laughs> I was basing it on the MYSL website, and that may be out of date. Yeah, it's probably, there's probably an old one that is. Yeah. yeah. Now. Shouldn't be up there, I should say. Yeah. And I think that's important, right? Is yeah. something having a website takes yeah. time, yeah. making content takes time. We have a town that has a website. So those things would be able to more mm -hmm. adequately flow through mm -hmm. there. And it's not because you guys aren't trying. I mean, I think you know, yes. I stood up, I helped stand up a nonprofit. Yeah. I run one right now. And um, there is no end to the number of corrections you can do each day and fixes mm -hmm. you can make. Um, I guess I would ask, um, has the Enfield Recreation Commission expressed an interest in taking over all of the fundraising capacity? Because it sounds like that might be what Tracy is suggesting. Not the recreation board on fundraising. So they're not. Okay. So if they haven't expressed like a strong interest in taking over all of that, Matt, you're right here. Do you want yeah, to take I'm over? Chair. Hi, I'm yeah, chair. Yeah. Do you want to take over fundraising? No, I, it hasn't been discussed. Okay. There was no thought. Okay. So there's no thought. I was just wondering if that was. There was no thought of the town doing fundraising. Fundraising. Right. Okay. And so <laughs> leaving it as an outside fundraising group is. Yeah. Okay. I was just, I was wondering where that came from if I had missed something. Nope. Okay. So um, I guess let's just we're tonight is about talking about this. We've talked about it in prior years in different forms, but this is the first time we have a proposal coming to us with real numbers. Uh, and so I'd like to just go around the table and get a general like, yes, are you interested in proceeding and investigating this or a no, you're not comfortable with it um, so that Ed has an idea of direction. Is that fair? Yeah. OK. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. A qualified yes. Yes. So okay. that's. I'll do a little more research. I'll go talk to other towns. Mm -hmm. If we do do this, I'll be back to ask the select board to set up an infield recreation fund, so the money can go into there. That way, if there's any extra money from the mm -hmm. sports themselves, they can carry over year to year to be yeah. spent on infield recreation. Like right now, we got a revolving fund. Uh, Yep, and so I'm going to go to Dave Beaufay, had his hand up. Hi, um, can you hear me? This is Sharon Beaufay. Dave got pulled away, so I have a question from him, though. Can I ask that? Yes. Okay, so Dave said that um, his understanding was that the Canaan Select Board withdrew from their cooperation earlier, previous years with the Enfield Rec Department. And Dave was just questioning whether there was any thought or provision for if kids came from Canaan and wanted to participate um, but didn't have funds, uh, would they be able to access this funding? Or would, I mean, what would the, the consideration be for that? There, there would be a, there would be a non-resident fee added to the cost of anybody that was not in a participating town that fun, helped fund this and then you know working with mysl and others i'm sure there'll be some sort of scholarship mm -hmm. program for kids that are not able to, to pay that yeah so i can speak to the scholarships we give out very few scholarships there are very few requests i think we did three for soccer this year um so. i just want to make sure that everybody is clear uh so it was a statement, Canaan did not withdraw. They just stopped paying and they didn't bother tell us. So oh. the drawing suggests a formal. Um, same, same, yeah. so same to me. <laughs> well, no, no, it, it isn't because it wasn't really a voted item. It was that the town manager at the time just simply 
one dollar it and walked away. And I don't think there was the knowledge. And so there were a lot of really hard feelings because they were all of a sudden like, oh, hey, Enfield took off on their own. And we're like, actually, you guys just kind of stop paying. And it just went by the wayside. So there was no formal process. It's it's not quite the same. So having that discussion is going to be part of what we have to do. And I've had the discussion with the NYSL board mm -hmm. and maybe something that I neglected to put in here. But we have been looking at those plans and it would be payment before payment before the season or before the year began. So we're not chasing down those funds. It either gets paid or the resident fees established. Right. Because we had to yes. bill them yeah. um, and for services already rendered. So that was, and it was a little bit of a challenge. So go ahead. Sir. Uh, my name's Sue Young and um, we live on Shaker Boulevard. Before we moved to Enfield full time in 2013, I served 12 years on the Hanover Parks and Recreation Board. Half of them is the chair of the board. Um, so I have some knowledge of the issues related to youth sports teams and how they're managed across different towns. Now, some of you may not be aware that um, Hanover and Norwich share the youth sports programs for grades six through eight, but it's managed solely through the Hanover Rec program up to grade five, the individual towns keep their own youth programs. So there's a Norwich little kids soccer program. There's a Hanover little kids soccer team. Sometimes they play each other, sometimes they don't. So, but mainly at the middle school, because the middle school kids from Hanover and Norwich go to the same school, all of those youth programs reside with the Hanover Rec program and the director of the Hanover Recreation Department is in charge of it. So or having worked with that program for 12 years, I've known the problems that can occur from multi-town jurisdictional programming over sports. Um, many of the problems are due to the differences and the two towns philosophy regarding number of practices, number of games, playing time, tournaments, uniforms, and the like. With this proposal that is before the board right now, the management of recreational sports will fall primarily to the Enfield Recreation Director. Is he prepared to feel the increase in number of emails, complaints, phone calls, and problems that will now come directly to him and not to this gentleman here if he's in charge of it all. Based on my 12 years of experience, that's going to be a substantial amount of work. And that's not even including setting up how many teams you're going to have, setting up reg registration, setting up game schedules, practice schedules, field allotment, and the like. This is all gonna, going to to fall on Kevin's lap. And 10% of his time is not going to be sufficient to be able to handle it all. I've been involved in athletics my entire life, including as a varsity athlete in college. I'm very aware of the benefits of having children play sports. Each of my three sons, one of whom is here tonight, played three sports every year from kinder kindergarten through high school. I'm also very familiar with the problem in finding volunteer coaches for all levels of youth sports. Beginning with K-1 soccer, I've coached many of my son's sports teams, including as an assistant hockey coach for my son's sport team when I could barely skate. And the last thing a young boy wants is his mom in the locker room or on the bench. Believe me, I heard it. It is my understanding that the main reason this proposal has been made is due to the lack of volu volunteers. However, delegating the management of M MYLS to the Enfield Rec Director will not solve this problem. In fact, it will more likely exasperate the situation as non-Enfield parents will now see it as Enfield's responsibility to find coaches since our rec director is running the program. This will be especially true if non-residents pay a higher registration fee to play. 
Ideally, it would be wonderful to be able to offer recreational sports to all children of the Mascoma School District. However, I do not believe the Enfield taxpayers should be subsidizing children from other towns, nor should our town employees and parents bear the brunt of the workload. I understand why this proposal is attractive to the NYLS. However, I do not see it being beneficial to Enfield in the long run and believe we could be we would be better off developing our own town-based recreational sports program. I think in in summary, I think we have been talking a lot about Enfield's image and Enfield as a town. If we continue talking about Mascoma this, Mascoma that, we will never never develop our own entity, our own personality. It will always be Mascoma. Maybe that's the way the town wants to go. I don't know. But I I I really think we need to think seriously about this proposal. Thank you. You go ahead, Matt. I have some questions. Thirty-two thousand and change a year. Does that include the cost of uniforms and equipment? Um, that I took there the last three, two years, two years of expenses from MYSL and Kevin's salary for 10 hours a week and minus it out. So this just is wasn't sure. what they've been spending. You know, if um, we get some sponsorships and those types of things, which I think they have gotten some of those, it'll, it'll help alleviate some of those costs. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to make sure that everybody in this room understands the conversation of the rec director mm -hmm. position taking over youth sports did happen when the rec commission regrouped three years ago, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And we talked about having a rec director for the Enfield rec department instead of, you know, the Mascoma Youth Sports League and then the Mascoma or the uh, Mascoma Parks and Mascoma Valley Parks and Rec. And that got dissolved into one. So the youth sports discussion happened at the time. We decided it probably wasn't uh, a good idea for the rec director to take on youth sports because of the demand that was already present. Um, if the if the capability is there now, then that's that's obviously a decision for the town and the rec department. Um, but it, I don't want it to come across that this is a new conversation because yeah. it's not. Yeah. Um, we had, you mentioned scholarships for kids from out of town, and this kind of links to one of my other questions about the MYSL, the remaining faction of the MYSL board. If there's a scholarship fund due to fundraising, that's great. Who decides how much and who gets those scholarships? Is it the rec department or is it the remaining MYSL board? The remaining MYSL board, I hear the booster idea and everything, is there going to be a clear mission statement and whether or not there's an advisory authority on their part or decision-making authority on their part, is it going to continue to be called the MYSL mm -hmm. or will it just be the Enfield Rec Department? Um, the, the 10 hours makes me nervous because I know how much Kevin's got going on, the Rec Department has going on right now. And I, I want to make sure we're not underselling how much time it really takes because even in this conversation, the talk of well spent hours and hours answering emails and Jamie's got great hair <laughs> and 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 it just sounds like there's a lot involved here so I want to make sure that if we're moving forward with this as a town that we really assess the demand on time yeah. and whether or not that's something our current rec position rec director position can afford um and then I guess the other question would be what kind of communication and or cooperation would happen between the currently established rec commission and the remaining faction of the MYSL board. I don't expect answers to these questions. I more just wanted to put them out there so that it lives in people's brains when we're moving forward talking about this. I don't actually, I, I, I personally, not speaking on behalf of the rec commission right now, I don't mind the idea of rec department taking over sports unified front in terms of offering youth sports is a good thing mm -hmm. just don't underestimate it i'm not trying to echo and also this is not necessarily a family thing but <laughs> don't as, underestimate it i mean we've had we have monthly meetings with kevin we know how much he's doing yeah don't want to make i want to make sure we're not underselling the actual no he's been a part of this that. conversation the whole time and we've yeah. looked at the volunteers and how much time they're putting in 
and what he thinks he would need to put in to do this. And like I said, some weeks it's going to be the majority of your week and the beginning of sports season is going to be extremely busy and other times it may be almost nothing. I did have one more question. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Emily, just one real quick. How many towns currently participate in MYSL? There's five. Five? It's the school district. So and the school district. And orange. Is it restricted to the school district? So if you come outside of those five towns, well, are you not allowed to participate in MYSL? Well, so we're part of the Upper Valley um, Rec Association. Yeah. And you're, there's a rule you're supposed to, if you offer a program within your thing, the kid is supposed to go there. Yeah, there are exceptions here and there, sure. but for the most part, it's, that's it. Mm-hmm. That was just my only yeah. point. Yeah. Emily, I'm sorry. Emily, you know. mm-hmm. um, as vice chair of recreation commission, I'll jump in and put that mm-hmm. hat on for just a quick second and um, echo much of what Matt said. It's, this has been an ongoing conversation for a long period of time. Um, it's something that I would love to see supported for the youth in our area. I think the one question I have. Um, is if Kevin is focusing on the numbers and those pieces and the scheduling and MYSL is focusing on the fun pieces, who's doing the kind of haranguing of the volunteers and those kinds of things? Because I know that that is a major time consuming piece. And that honestly is the biggest concern is that if you're not able to fill those volunteer spaces, how are we as Enfield going to manage that? because I've already seen the emails kind of going out from the most recent season. And so if we're looking at stepping into that, what does that look like? What's our fallback plan? You know, is Kevin going to be out there coaching? Like what, how does that work? We'll be marketing some of that and we'll be doing what other towns do. And you'll, I mean, unfortunately you'll have to limit the, here's how many spaces we have. And this is how we're going to fill those spaces. And, you know, those are rules we're going to have to, to come up with and, Usually what we've seen talking with other departments is when it the rubber starts to hit the road, the parents step up. If you're you know, yeah, so I can give a take some pressure, example. but I, I can give a perfect example. We had 36 kids for third and fourth boys. Mm-hmm. We had two 18 size teams, and one of the coaches said, both coaches said, we can't deal with this. They went right to the parents at the sideline and said, We need volunteers. Mm-hmm. And we got volunteers, so we have a third team. So usually the parents, when it finally comes to that point, they do. But you, the problem is you have to get to that point. I'm actually going to back Jamie up on this one real quick. I coach the kindergarten soccer team. <laughs> um, How'd you get coached into that? It's a guy on the rec commission who told me it seemed if I didn't do it. Um, so he's not wrong, though. I spent the first two practices. I'd send the kids off running around with my wife, actually, who's helping me. Um, and I flat out said, then there are 28 kids on this team and they're all five or six and I need help. And, uh, last practice, I had a couple parents step up. I'm actually not going to be there next weekend. So I've had three different parents come up to me and say, mm-hmm. I can cover for you. So I think there is the capability of it. I just think if, if we're going to move forward with this, which I, I actually, like I said, personally, I think it's not a bad idea. You've got to have some real defined yeah. rules and guidelines and responsibilities. If you leave things up in the air, if you leave them ambiguous, you're going to end up with a mess. And uh, that's all. I just want to make sure we're being careful about this. I think I would just like to comment on, you know, Hanover and Norwich have a very unique um, relationship and they have four different districts within their SAU. So what? I believe it's four districts within the rest. I know they have Norwich and Hanover are separate. So we don't have different districts. We have one district. There's no Enfield. There's no Canaan. We're just all one district. So like you're never going to get a Dorchester team. You're never going to get an Orange team. You're probably not going to get a Grafton team. Um, we're a lot smaller and having worked intimately with um, both, you know, youth sports and obviously in capacity as school board chair, I've kind of seen how it works. The That us versus them piece is something that has torn Mascoma apart over the years. And I think it's really, really important to start propagating togetherness young. And I love 
that Mask Up My Youth Sports brought everyone together on the playing field because those kids are going to go to school together. So it's something that we start them now. We do the togetherness and there's there's no like we have um, the town. Each town has a moral and legal obligation to provide for their residents and they have the option as part of their human services. Some people call it welfare department. They can provide for kids, too. So it doesn't have to just fall on a scholarship program and fundraising, right? So we have kids who are, say they want to go skiing, they can go through human services. There are guidelines and there are rubrics, and I think that's the appropriate way to do it. Then it's, you know, it's it's got some guide rails. It's not who's friends with who, who knows to ask, and it becomes very clear. And I think the town could help a, a non-resident kid if there was a fee, their town could choose to do that. So I think there are some real opportunities to make this work. And I, I guess I would like to see it be the inclusive piece. I definitely don't want to see it be Enfields. Yes. Um, Hanover Rec offered scholarship mm -hmm. uh, offers to kids mm -hmm. too. Not everybody in Hanover or Norwich is filthy rich, mm -hmm. contrary oh, yeah. to the My mom's in Hanover. perception. Um, and what we found is there, and I think you found it as well, since you said mm -hmm. you only gave out three scholarships, is people are embarrassed to ask mm -hmm. for help from their their um, town fellow townsmen. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're embarrassed to go to the rec program and say, I can't afford the $50 to have my son or daughter play soccer. I can't afford that uniform. I can't afford... You know, to I can't afford to take the day off on Saturday to bring my child to soccer. So, and they're also afraid, they're also embarrassed to go and ask for town services. So I think it's wonderful that you people, we say these things are out there, but I'll tell you from experience, people are very reluctant to show their fellow neighbors that they don't have the resources to help their child. So they'd rather not have their child participate because they don't want to be embarrassed. I've, I've seen it time and time again. So I think it, I don't, I'm not saying don't offer the scholarships and all the other aid, but that's why people don't sign up for it. It's not, there isn't a need. It's there, people are too embarrassed to ask for it. And that's something we can certainly as a community improve upon, right? If there's a stigma, some of that comes from us. Um, obviously, I work with the food pantry folks every week and nearly every day. So some of it is being inviting, and maybe that's something we can do a better job of. Uh, are there other comments from the board? If not, you have what you need from us to kind of get started? Yeah, I really okay. wanted to get consensus yeah. before I went and talked to any other towns or anything so i can do that now and i'll get a lot better feel okay. with the with the temperature is. great thank you thank you for coming all right and our next on our list is conservation commission application we have edward rippy from holly drive i would entertain a motion <laughs> I move that we accept uh, Ed's application to be a member of the Conservation Commission. I'll second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. Congratulations to Mr. Rippey. Uh, next up, we have Old Home Days Committee applications. We have both Elizabeth Levante and Daisy Coppins. I think, hope I said their name right. Mm -hmm. um, I would entertain a motion on both. I assume there are openings on the must be, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, the number of them. I move that we accept Daisy Coppins and Elizabeth Labonte as members of the um, Old Days Home Committee. We'll second that. Okay. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we are on to Mascoma Lakeside Park Committee proposed guidelines for acceptance of material gifts. Um, I was here to speak on that. Okay, I was very confused. Come on, that, that, that. <laughs> Yeah, 
Thank you. Uh, Mescoma Lakeside Park has the potential to be a really beautiful, beautiful park. It's got a stunning view, rolling terrain, a stand of mature native trees, well placed. So it, it has a great potential and the select board has already approved a, a landscaping plan that will make it even more beautiful in the future. So it's only natural that members of the community are going to want to use that beautiful spot, public spot, to create some kind of public memorial or, or uh, remembrance of some person or uh, occasion. So, in fact, we've already had an offer of a, of a gift. And to maintain high standards of uh, beauty and park atmosphere, uh, the committee feels very strongly that we have to vet gifts uh, that come in uh, are offered to the park. So this, these guidelines were prepared and approved unanimously by the committee in order to accomplish that. Uh, some, somebody's going to have to be sure that whatever gifts come in to that landscape there uh, fit in and uh, enhance rather than detract from the beauty of the park. So that's what these guidelines are about. Okay. Let's start at the end of the table. I know. You can move yourself, you know. <laughs> no, I think having some guidelines for people makes sense. We have the real substantive comments. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I hesitate with 7E, the tasteful design. I have mm -hmm. a hard time understanding who decided what is and is not tasteful. And there might be like ambiguity in there if it, if I don't know if it was ever like. I think really the committee, committee that, that is running the park mm -hmm. decides that. Like if they it like. It cannot be uh, individuals wanting to make a donation because right. we all have different ideas of what's tasteful. Yeah. Right. So can't be me. So it's. Mm -hmm. It's the committee. Okay. That's the whole point of this. Yeah. As it says in number one, material gifts must be compatible with the master plan for the park as approved by the select board. Um, and as a, you know, it, it'll be reviewed by the committee, the Lakeside Park Committee, yeah. and then presented to the select board for final acceptance. Do we have to have a say in it? The select board's decide. The select board has to accept the donation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not very the well advice of the very good committee. All right. So I'm going to throw a wrench out there because I've wondered about gifts in general to the town, right? Like we've run into trouble before where somebody somewhere past accepted a painting that was already damaged and then we said we'd fix it and we didn't budget for it. We didn't do it. Right. So, but we don't have a gift policy. So I'm wondering why we would make a gift policy for one subset of our town and not a gift policy on the whole. But when I talk to Ed about gifts, and I'm just going to throw the spotlight on you for a second, there there are guidelines in the RSAs on on accepting gifts. So um, to me, the Lakeside Park Committee, while they have proposed a design, it all flows up to us, and I don't see why we wouldn't have operations make these decisions for us um, within the confines of the law. Well, I think you use your committee, and I think do you? Okay. I think what you do is you look through this and you. I guess authorize the committee to use these guidelines to make recommendations back to you. I think that's the right process as they yeah. review any proposed gift okay. prior to the person buying it. Right. And then they venture an opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes. You'd say this 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 would not be appropriate for this right. setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or yeah, this fits right in. Or we already have 30 picnic tables. We don't need 10 more. Right. 
And even though it's a whole new design of picnic table, you know, we've got 29 that are the other kind. We and, might take a monetary donation to order something yeah. on their behalf, or we can work with them to right. place an order that they could. I have no issue with individual things within the town of Enfield having selective gift yeah. recipient policies. One I can think of that's going to come up, and surely is going to deal with this, people are going to want to give uh, money to provide for gifts to the library once it's constructed. They're going to come in and they're going to say, I really would love the library to have the front desk, for example. And the library board will decide what that gift will be. And so different departments will have different qualifications for gifts. I guess, um, are we setting a precedent here where we're going to have a huge park committee? And you know what I mean? Are we, or is it just this is? You know what I mean? That's where I get nervous, right? Well, like, you, are we going to say, oh, but they get 10 picnic tables, but this one gets decided by the town. So are we creating extra? You've already created a Mascoma Lakeside Park Committee yeah. that's purpose is exactly for this. Is to vet things. Okay. And so, to design the park and to make it what it is. Right. So yeah. you say right. But at what, at what point does that sunset once the park is complete? Does it? Do we continue to populate it with people forever? To make these decisions, that's kind of where I'm at. That'll be like, the, the select board's decision. And at that point, you know, if it transitions at some time in the future, mm -hmm. then it transitions and we will we'll treat it like any other okay. one. But I have talked to Kevin and Tim, Jim. We haven't done it yet, but kind of the same thing we talked about is how many benches do we want in each park? Where do we want mm -hmm. them? What do we want them to look like for the same purpose? I mean, we have had things just show up. Hey, we're going to, we want to donate this. <laughs> mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want mm -hmm. three brown benches and one green one in the park. We want them to match and look good. And mm -hmm. so that's, you know, it's something we should work on. Yes, operations does a lot of the parks, but we do have a Mascoma Lakeside Park Committee right now that's put together for this purpose in designing and placing stuff in the park. So I think, you know, looking over their guidelines and, uh, no, authorizing them to use those guidelines to make recommendations to the select boards appropriate. Okay, um, I guess I'd like to strike the word only upon recommendation from Mascoma Lakeside Park Committee. The reason I say that there are subsets in this town who feel like they aren't heard, um, and so I think if somebody doesn't feel comfortable, they should still always be able to come to the select board, right? So only limits their ability to come to the select board, and we don't limit anyone else from coming to us. Um, so I'd like to strike only, and it could just say select board upon recommendation for Mascoma Lakeside Park Committee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where is the word only? It is in the first paragraph, um, second to last sentence. It says select board only upon. I would suggest just striking the word only because we shouldn't limit the ability of citizens to come to us anytime. That doesn't mean we're going to override them. It just means that they can still come. I think our, our, we'd accept that change. Pardon me? We would accept that change. Yeah. I think, I think it's the same overall that. meeting. I think it's the same yeah. overall meeting. It just. Uh, strike yeah, the word only. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think it makes sense because it also, right, you always have some sort of appeal. It's mm -hmm. not really an appeal, but, you know, people should always be able to bring. They should be able to come mm -hmm. here. With right. Like if somebody doesn't like the planning board's decision, they go to the ZBA. If they don't right. like this, you right. know. You know yeah. Um, but this also made it still makes it very clear that the mm -hmm. that the recommendations are coming from Lakeside Park Committee, and that's mm -hmm. yeah, the process. Well, and you guys at that point could still hear somebody no, and exactly. say, "Thank you, we're going to send this to the committee right. for review." <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's a collaborative effort, and I yeah. I don't think these are bad guidelines. I just wanted to make sure that we are not setting ourselves up for a set of rules for every park and a new committee. Or so, if you feel comfortable with these, we'll help you guys with operations. I'm fine with it. Okay, I would take so you or do we need a public that's can we establish guidelines without yeah I don't know that we need a motion but you could make a motion if you wanted to for I think overall I would hope that the yeah. select board would adopt these guidelines mm -hmm. well they don't need to adopt them because they're not going to be their guidelines they're going to be the Mascoma Lakeside Parks mm -hmm. guidelines. Well, we except can support that. We're simply advisory. We don't actually, in the final analysis, we're not making any decisions. We're advising this. I mean, yeah. thank you for giving us that 
uh, impression, but we we don't we're we're simply advising this committee, this board. So I move that we accept these guidelines as proposed by the Mascoma Lakeside Park Committee. A and second. Am and amended to remove. And amended to remove the word only. Line four, word two, word three. Um, second that. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, is there further discussion from the board? It looks like Dave Bofe has his hand up. Dave. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can good. Um, as a member of that committee, I uh, I echo uh, uh, that these are recommendations that we would make to the. Uh, uh, the select board for final decision um, and uh, um, could obviously be overruled if, uh, if, if that uh, was felt by the board to be appropriate. Um, there would, has been substantial discussion uh, within the committee about this and uh, how to uh, um, deal with uh, some proposed uh, uh, donations that got ahead of this uh, um, recommended policy um, but I think that uh, um, this is a, this is a good compromise thank you thank you any further discussion on the motion from the board okay seeing that all those in favor aye. aye opposed abstentions it passes unanimously thank you Doug you do thank you thank you thank you um, so you have some administrative items in your packet I believe that takes us down to other business to come before the Board of Selectmen. Um, I just quickly like to um, tell the board I intended to write a uh, commendation for Norm, Norman Rule, and I did not get it done. So I will send that on for the next packet, um, seeing as how there was no way we could turn it around before the service. So um, if anybody has something they feel should go into it, they could send it to Ed, and I'll send him a draft as well. Um, public comments. Can I back up one? Oh, wait, where are you? I, I have a question on the land use change tax. Ed, where does that money go? And general general funds, general a line fund. of general fund. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all. Public comments. Okay, go ahead. Um, just on the root for sewer. I think the town needs to come up with a mechanism to enforce the waivers. Because this, the Halloran property is now the third property that has changed hands. Mm -hmm. In the case of one of them, the zoning board made a conditional variance that they took out. In the case of the other half of the Halloran property, when it was sold, nothing happened. They have not hooked up. It's been over two years. I think we need to have a mechanism to enforce those waivers, okay? Um, and it may be as simple as when a property is going to be sold, they have to call the town and say, are there any taxes due? Is there any water payments due? Well, the third piece should be to tell that because it's not the seller who's going to tell them that they have to hook up. It's going to be the buyer who finds out after they bought the property that they have to hook up. I think we need to come up with some kind of a mechanism. Probably the easiest place is prior to the closing, they have to know that they're going to have to hook up to the sewer. I mean, we the planning board made a conditional because we don't have the power to make them hook up. Only the water commissioners can make people hook up because they're the only ones that can give the hookups. So um, we got to do something because in another three years, everybody's got to hook up mm -hmm. because that's when all the waivers run out. Mm -hmm. So good point. Just to put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do have one question. Is it possible for this group to formally I don't know what the right but to give the planning board permission to require hookup as a condition for site plan reviews. Is that legal? 
That would be the question, I guess. No. I don't think so, because we don't have the ability to bake the hook up. No, I guess I'm saying, so it's I think, no, what I'm asking is, I think is, 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 is if probably, we made it a requirement, yeah. could we then basically tell the planning board that this is a requirement and you can, and then the planning board can make it a condition? That's is there an okay. avenue there? We'd have to yeah. make sure we understand it. And, right. As we a, could get it drafted by legal that it's, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. almost a direction from the select board to the planning board to. Mm -hmm. And, and we're going to have to pursue those people who are need to do that now. Yeah. yeah. We can't just let that slide by. Right. And, I mean, because that was the deal for everybody on sewer was yes. mm -hmm. those people on Route 4, they're all going to be hooking up. So your sewer. And I remember to some of those discussions. Up. Right. And, and they were tough discussions because certain people were made promises that legally couldn't have been made. And we yeah. own the bag, even though we didn't make those promises ourselves. So I think making it very clear um, and state law is very clear. Oh, yeah. Whether we like it or not, that maybe we point to state law and say and set the expectation that you will comply with state law and you will do this. Um, I would be in favor of having legal do something because I, I don't know what the language is myself and we've definitely struggled with this multiple times we sat in very long meetings where there's paperwork and like I've got this and I've got that and it gets very confusing because at the end of the day it doesn't matter how many pieces of paper you pull out of a hat the requirement stays the same are there any waivers that expire in less than that three-year time frame? there's a change of Ownership, I mean, change of ownership, other than change of ownership or change. I mean, of I would say there are some have already hired. If they're septic, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right, right. Mm -hmm. So, and we would have to double check. But when this came before the planning board, Rod provided sort of a summary of past changes, and but that summary was from I think 2019, and that listed some that were going to expire in 2021. I have no further information of whether they. Yeah, I, I, I believe most of them yeah. have hooked up. Yeah. yeah, we did have a list of people yeah. who were working on it. And I would say there were a lot of folks where it was a stretch probably financially and they did it. So I think it's not fair to just, I don't know. Well, and, and part of it is that this was, where when it went in, it was it was not just an agreement with the landowners on the report quarter. It was an agreement with all the other users mm -hmm. of water and sewer. Mm -hmm. Over time, these will phase, yes. and so it was not just individual landowners in the town. It was, and it was actually the town as a whole yeah, who created the Route Four District. And yeah. as the um, TIF district that's paying a bond, mm -hmm. this was a this was a townwide commitment mm -hmm. and an agreement with every resident of town, not just with individual property owners in that corridor. It was a lot cheaper two years ago for everybody to hook up. To mm -hmm. it now they're also going to have to pay the limited mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any? Okay. Dave? Um, many years ago, when uh, Watt Sewer uh, went into uh, uh, Maple Street uh, for the first time, um, there was no choice about being required to hook up and um, to. I, I opposed the, the exceptions at the time that. Uh, uh, the Route 4 uh, sewer went in, but uh, I, I think, uh, you know, it's it's time to um, enforce those uh, agreements and make sure that they uh, happen um, so that it's fair to those of us who are facing huge increases in water and sewer uh, in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment this evening? Okay. Seeing none, I take a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm not taking a sense of unanimous or adherence. Okay. Um, do you have items for us to sign?